Seeing her perform was like seeing a mermaid walk. Tonight, bidding farewell, a community gathers in Winnipeg to remember Anouk singer Kelly Fraser. So I really wanted this piece to show kind of a warrior woman um, and how what you put on your body and what you wear can make you feel comfortable and confident in your own skin. Walking the Walk, a dress designed by an Anishinaabe Mohawk woman, makes waves at the Golden Globe Awards ceremony in Hollywood. Upon learning of George Eliot Clark's association with one of the persons responsible for the violent death of Pamela George, we approached the lecture committee chair to express multiple concerns regarding the forthcoming Woodrow Lloyd lecture. And he said he wouldn't listen, but he did. A poet decides not to hold a lecture after he was roundly criticized for being insensitive. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. The life of Anouk pop sensation Kelly Fraser was honored over the weekend at a vigil in Winnipeg. Fraser died by suicide on Christmas Eve. She was just 27 years old. More than 200 people gathered uh, Saturday evening at sundown at Udena Circle at the Forks. The memorial was filled with prayers, medicine, and drum songs. Fraser was originally from Santa Kilowak, Nunavut, but was living in Winnipeg at the time of her death. The singer-songwriter made waves after releasing her rendition of Rihanna's song Diamonds in 2013, but it was an Inuktitut. Her second album, Sedna, garnered her a Juno nomination in 2018. She was working on a third album titled Decolonize at the time of her death. Many, including Fraser's family and her friends, shared memories of the young sung singer. Seeing her perform was like seeing a mermaid walk. It was very mystifying the way she moved and sang. and. Um, she had so much energy, you know, she was very true to herself, she's very unapologetic for feeling things and I think that's what was most admirable about being around her. Sorry, Kelly was 26, not 27. APTN News has uncovered a second youth suicide involving the same Hamilton, Ontario treatment centre where a First Nations team also died by suicide in October 2017. 17-year-old Tyra Williams Dory also died in a wooded area about two and a half years before Devin Freeman took his own life. More than six months after he went missing, Freeman was found hanging from a tree 35 meters behind one of the Linwood Charlton Center's facilities. Williams Dory's father uh, is supporting the Freeman family's call for a coroner, coroner's inquest. Reporter Kenneth Jackson's full story on these deaths is on our website at aptnnews.ca. The University of Regina was set to go ahead with a lecture that incited out public outrage, but the poet at the center of the controversy, George Eliot Clark, cancelled his lecture where he said he, quote, may or may not, end quote, read the poetry of a convicted killer of an Indigenous woman. Hippotan's Priscilla Wolf has the story. Pamela George was brutally killed in Regina in 1995. One of her killers, Stephen Cumberfield, now known as Stephen Brown, is currently a published poet and living in Mexico. His work was edited by George Eliot Clark, who was scheduled to do a lecture on January 23rd at the University of Regina. But after news of this broke on CBC, public outrage grew loud. Rachel Janzi, the coordinator of the Tatawao Student Center at the University of Regina, said that the management and staff spoke out. Upon learning of George Eliot Clark's association with one of the persons responsible for the violent death of Pamela George, we approached the lecture committee chair to express multiple concerns regarding the forthcoming Woodrow Lloyd lecture. George Eliot Clark also released his own statement, cancelling his upcoming lecture. George Eliot Clark said, After further reflection about the issue of my proposed lecture at the University of Regina scheduled for January 23rd, it is with great sadness that I have decided to withdraw this presentation. I never intended to cause such anguish for the family of Pamela George and the Indigenous community. And for that I am truly sorry. I am a mixed black and Indigenous writer and scholar and my advocacy for justice for Indigenous peoples and people of colour in Canada must never be in doubt. My purpose in my talk was to discuss the role of poets in dealing with social issues. But that interest has been lost in the current controversy. So regrettably, I have asked the University of Regina to cancel my appearance. 
Brenda Dubois, the Cookham at the Tattawell Student Center, responded to the news of Clark canceling. One, the first prayer we did was that one that he would omit the readings. The second prayer that we uh, put out was that he actually canceled the lecture. So I thank Creator for, for helping getting those prayers answered uh, for our community. She says it shows more work needs to be done. I really, really would love us to use this as an opportunity to digress to really look at how this was put together and how can it get better. It's not about getting bitter. We can get bitter. It's not going to get us anywhere. But how do we get better at what we're doing and having relations? The university has a responsibility. Chastity DeLorme is a local community grassroots activist in the Treaty 4 area. Personally, I can't speak on behalf of what type of communication went on um, with those two departments, um, but what I can speak to is the lack of consultation within the Indigenous community. When it comes to the U of R making movements towards the TRC recommendations, um, I think they made a very poor choice, and especially when they were asked to reconsider um, moving forward with the event. The University of Regina also released a statement saying the only expectation among the university's leadership group which will include representatives from the Faculty of Arts sponsor of the Lloyd Lecture is to listen learn and share in a spirit of cooperation and mutual understanding. These consultations will take place in person or by phone over the coming days and weeks and will not be open to the public or media. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Regina. We want to hear what you think. Here's how you can continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow APTN News on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more Indigenous news. Some of Australia's most ecologically fragile regions are being threatened by wildfires that continue to devastate the country. This, uh, this kangaroo island off the coast of South Australia, it's been described as Australia's Galapagos Islands because it's home to the country's most endangered animals. Experts working there say that wildfires over the past few days have undone decades of careful conservation work and killed thousands of koalas and kangaroos. The out-of-control bushfires in Australia are devastating, to say the least. Our colleagues at National Indigenous Television are on the ground there. With more on the story, here's NITV's Douglas Smith. More than 12 million acres burned, the military called in, and thousands evacuated. Fire conditions in many parts of Australia are worsening by the day. We've still got more than 130 fires burning across the state uh, and 54 of those are not contained. The good news is all fires are now back at the advice alert level. Still got um, um, a couple of thousand people, just under two and a half thousand people deployed across the fire grounds uh, working on establishing and consolidating containment lines. The south coast of New South Wales and Victoria's East Gippsland are facing some of the worst conditions as some of the hardest areas hit. In the south coast town of Eden on Monday, devastated locals watched on in disbelief as their local wood chip mill burned from a distance. Uh, pretty horrifying. I've lived here since I was four years old. And um, I've never seen anything like this before. It employs a lot of people, not just at the chip mill, but uh, the tyre service, fuel, everything. Today, the Victorian government was the first state to establish a permanent bushfire recovery agency Evacuated with a sole focus on reasons, coordinating so all resources gone. necessary to help communities affected by bushfires. This is going to be a standing uh, bushfire recovery agency because we are going to see longer fire seasons and we are going to see uh, we should never... Uh, we should just be honest about the fact we're going to see more and more fires, more and more damage as each fire season comes. In South Australia over the weekend, Kangaroo Island was impacted hard, with the loss of one of the country's top resorts reduced to ash and rubble. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced today the establishment of a national bushfire recovery fund to help rebuild communities Good devastated by everyone. fires now and in the future. The Commonwealth is committing an additional and initial $2 billion over the next two 
calendar years starting right now. With weeks still to come for the fire season, there's worry about what can happen. These fires are quite early in our fire season. Like, um, we, we've got another eight weeks of potential fire and, um, and there's no rain forecast and that's the only thing that will stop these fires. Douglas Smith, NITV News. 2,000 kilometres away, there is concern in New Zealand. The sky above Auckland has turned orange with thick haze from the Australian fires. Some residents are in panic mode, causing a flood of emergency calls about what they describe as very scary skies. So far, there is no indication how long the haze will remain, that colour or what impact it'll have. We need to take a quick break, but when we come back, we visit Tuk 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 for a first-hand look at climate change there. First, here's tomorrow's weather starting on the East Coast. Starting off in Charlottetown, we got minus 3 in snow, minus 2 in Fredericton and snowy. La Grande River, minus 15 in snow, sunshine in Nain and minus 14. Minus 3 in sunny in Montreal, Shibugabu, minus 9 in sunshine. Zero in snow for North Bay, minus one in snow in Sault Ste. Marie. Capus Casing and Timmins, snowy, minus one, minus 18 in snow in Big Trout Lake. Minus 18 in sunshine for Norway House, minus 19 in the Paw and Sunny. Minus 14 in sunshine for Brandon in Winnipeg, minus 13 in Sunny in Dauphin. Minus 15 in sunshine for Saskatoon, minus 18 in Sunny in Yorkton. Minus 22 in snow in Larage, minus 24 in Sunny in Stony Rapids. Welcome back. Finding working solutions for eroding coastlines in Canada's far north is complex and challenging, but according to Indigenous youth, they help to understand the severity, and there's no better way to learn that than to listen to elders. Here's another look at a story by Charlotte Moritz Jacobs in Tuk Tuk Tuk. It's two degrees in August, a month once known for ideal temperatures in Tuk Tuk Tuk. Now, altered weather patterns from climate change bring stronger and more frequent storms. Northern youth are here because each have felt the effects of global warming in their home communities. Like I live in Delaney and like our, like our main resource is from like the Great Bear Lake and I talked about like how much I want to like learn about it because like we notice over the years like it's changing. But the destruction this far north is like nothing they have ever seen. As sea ice melts, there are longer periods of open water, leading to bigger waves, thawing permafrost, and ultimately, rapid coastal erosion. It's something that Tuktoyaktuk elders Roy and Julia Cockney have experienced firsthand. You know, it used to be so much land across here. 40 years ago, you, you could, you know, have nice beach and you could walk long ways to through the water and the water is so high it's really hard to walk work from the shore now. The spring just lasts maybe two, three weeks. Years before that it used to last longer. When you're traveling with skidoo and there's snow you can travel. But out there in the land there's ground, bare ground puddles of water and soft snow and you, you're not sure if you're hitting the, gonna hit the soft snow next and your skidoo gets in there and your sled is behind you. Ah. Canada's Arctic landmass represents 40 percent of the country, nearly half of the far north's coastline. But less than 0.25 percent of Canadians live here. How the impacts of southern businesses have impacted the north because I we I don't see it like this back at home because I'm more like in the middle of the continent so I'm not as far north as Tuk 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 and when we went there and I saw like before and after pictures of like the coastline that just broke my heart because if the way it keeps going Tuk 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 is going to be under underwater soon and they've had seven storms already and it's not even storm season and seeing is believing before this conference I wasn't as strong emotionally, and then when we got to talk to Roy and Julia and other people in the community, it hits harder now, because not only because because when I when I think of climate change, I think it just affects my region, 
my people. And that's that's mentality I, I always had, mentality. But then now now, I get to see other people's perspective on what they're affected by, and now I feel more emotional about it. But having a dialogue around climate change with elders isn't without its challenges. Elders today, they've always grew up knowing the language, and like for us to not understand it, like if I were to ask them a question in English, they kind of like like it to hear it better in their language so they can get a better understanding of like what's the question. Here, and that's where they live long ago, traveling from place to place, no matter. But it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> Keep practicing. <laughs> and no matter what barriers youth may face, everyone here encourages each other to ask questions. Um, speak to your neighbors or like even like people further out to see if you're having the same problems or like if it's different and like it's a lot of learning experience when you're learning about the climate change. According to youth, the first step in tackling climate change is understanding how serious it really is. When we're learning about like how to live our, our lifestyle in the bush, I always say is we have to start them off young. Mm -hmm. And climate change, I believe, has the same philosophy. We got to start off young. Then we can carry that torch as we get older, and we can we can pass the torch to another another generation of youth. As access to hunting grounds wither, so do traditional diets. Tomorrow, youth open up about food sustainability and tour the territory's largest greenhouse. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Tuktaaktaak. Nine schools across the Yukon are testing new material for grade five students looking at the residential school system and the impact it continues to have on Indigenous communities. One school in the isolated community of Old Crow is taking part. Here's another look at that story by Chris McIntyre. Old Crow is located just above the Arctic Circle. With only 270 residents, it's the most northern community in the Yukon. Chief Zay Gitlet School is one of the educators testing the new Our Voices, Our Stories grade five curriculum. The three-part unit teaches students about traditional ways of life, residential schooling, and reconciliation all in an age-appropriate way. Before the material could be brought into the classroom, teachers had to participate in a two-day workshop to understand the content for themselves. Grade 5 teacher Nicole Berkland took part in the workshop. We did an overview of the unit, went through each lesson, went through some protocol with how to bring up this material, how to introduce it in the classroom, and really to there is a big emphasis on the teacher not being an expert and not being the one that's really uh, just, you know, dictating information. It's meant to be a learning process together. The unit was developed in collaboration with Yukon First Nations governments, elders, former residential school students, grade five teachers and historians. The resources include books, videos, and a compilation of stories from the territory. That was definitely a, a very different experience than I've had with other sorts of information being shared with me. And the dialogue is still open as a group. We're encouraged to share ideas, share information, talk about how things are going, and also use our mentors at the First Nations programs and partnerships to help guide what we do. <laughs> Tabitha Chason has a daughter in grade three. Chason's stepfather is a residential school survivor and she supports the new material being taught to students. I'm kind of for it. Um, it's teaching children, you know, that that kind of behavior is not okay. And I believe that at the earlier the age that that is taught that it's not okay, it's um, a, it's a type of prevention, really. You know, if kids are aware of that, they're more likely to come forward. If something happens to them that isn't right or doesn't make them feel good. No, what is this? It's black. Prior to this field test, there wasn't much age-appropriate information for teachers to share with students. After coming home from school one day, Chason's youngest son also had questions about residential school. He just outright just blurted to me, he's like, it's just like the Holocaust. And I had to completely agree with him, and then he asked why he wasn't taught about it. Don't build dams. Our Voices, Our Stories is still in the draft stage. 
Once the field test is concluded, the materials will be introduced in all Yukon elementary schools for the 2020-21 school year. Chris McIntyre, APTN National News, Old Crow. An Anishinaabe Mohawk designer's gown is spotted on the Golden Globe's red carpet. We'll tell you all about that after the break. But first, here's the rest of tomorrow's weather in the west and in the north. To northern Alberta, we got minus 26 in Sunny and Fort Chip, minus 16 in Snow in Grand Prairie. Minus 11 in Snow in Edmonton, minus 4 in Snow in Lethbridge. Eights for Tofino and Victoria and Rain, uh, Campbell River, the same thing. Minus 28 and clear in Fort Nelson, minus 6 in snow in Smithers. Old Crow, minus 35 and clear skies, minus 36 in snow in Dawson City. Wati and Yellowknife, minus 24 with a mix of sun and clouds. Minus 31 in sunshine for Inuvik and Colville Lake, minus 26 and clear in Saks Harbor. Minus 28 and clear in Repulse Bay, minus 31 in Whale Cove. The Glue Lick, minus 29 and clear skies. Same with Goya Haven, minus 31 and clear in Pangertongue. Welcome back. It's a great start to 2020 for a fashion designer from the Tamagami, Tamagami First Nation. One of her designs was showcased at the Golden Globe Red Carpets last night, an award show seen around the world. Nominee! Yeah. is e-talk personality Lainey Lou wore this dress on, to the Golden Globes on Sunday. The stunner was created by designer Leslie Hampton. Lou's stylist reached out to Hampton months in advance of the show to have a piece made for her. Hampton says that she has been getting many orders since the dress aired on television and says it's an honor to bring Indigenous design to the spotlight. So I really wanted this piece to show kind of a warrior woman um, and how what you put on your body and what you wear can make you feel comfortable and confident in your own skin. And I think it was just a perfect representation uh, to, to put on onto a, an, an e-talk reporter and, and really give her the confidence to interview all these uh, incredible celebrities um, and have everyone's story be told um, and really show authentic Indigenous representation of what Indigenous fashion could be. A couple of big scream epics took top honors at the 77th Golden Globes. This time, more than usually most, I had a fantastic cast. Quentin Tarantino's fable Once Upon a Time in Hollywood took three Golden Globes, including Best Motion Picture uh, for a Musical or Comedy and Best Judy Screenplay. Black, Brad Pitt also won for Best Supporting Actor. The First World War tale 1917 took Best Motion Picture Drama, while Sam Mendes won Best Director. And a special honor for Ellen DeGeneres, she received the Carol Burnett Award for Excellence in Television for her stand-up and TV work. If anybody wants to uh, get together and buy that gown uh, that Lainey Lou is wearing, it sells for $1,000 for the knee-length version and $1,500 for the floor-length version. If you're my size, hit me up. Maybe we can cost-share it. That is your Monday Night News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. I'm going to see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.